Okay, uh, so we will get started. Uh, the, the topic for today's class is to talk about convex set and functions first, and then we will get into optimization um, theory. So unconstrained optimization theory. So um, convexity is actually a very uh, attractive property in the context of optimization and also in the context of some uh, mathematical theories. So what is a convex set? So we say X is a subset of Rn is convex if and only if for every X1, X2 in capital X and alpha in open interval zero one, oh, sorry, closed interval zero one, alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2 also belongs to capital X, okay? So let's look at two examples. The first example is a, a sphere. So everything inside the sphere is part of the set. And the other is a horseshoe set so and everything inside this bounded region is a uh, part of the set x um, so if i pick any two points x1 and x2 this is my x1 this is my x2 and i pick alpha between 0 and 1 so then alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 would lie on this line segment that connects x1 and x2 Okay, and what we see here in this particular situation is that this entire line segment actually stays within the set capital X. Okay, so this is a convex set according to this definition. On the other hand, if I pick two points here within this set and I draw a line um, across these two points, then this line segment actually goes outside the set because uh, the set is basically this region. So it goes outside the set and therefore this is not a convex set. Okay, so, uh, so whenever you have a situation where the, you pick two points in the set and the entire line segment is within the set, then it's a convex set. Uh, whereas in a non-convex set, the line segment may fall outside the set. Okay, that's the definition of convex set. Any questions on this definition? Okay, let's consider another set. So this time, it's actually just the, just this part, okay, just the perimeter of the circle. So this is also a non-convex set because if I pick any two points on the perimeter and I draw a line segment, it goes outside the circle and therefore it's a non-convex set. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any question? No. Okay. For the set, um, the middle set, um, is the set is outside the circle. Sorry. Can you say that again? There is some amount of background noise. Uh, for the middle set, is the set is outside the circle? The set is outside what? Outside the circle? Outside the circle, yes. So this particular set is outside the circle. Um, this line segment, uh, let's, this line segment is outside the circle uh, because in this case, the set is, let me write the definition of the set, norm of X less than equal to one 
and this x is norm of x equal to one. So it's only the perimeter of the circle, not the inside of the circle. That's not part of the definition of set capital X. Okay, whereas in this case, everything inside the set is also part of, everything inside the perimeter is also part of the set X. Okay, that's the difference between these two, these two sets. So set number one and set number two, set number three. Okay. Let's see if you can show, you know, now that we have, we have done this uh, visually, let's see if we can actually show it uh, mathematically. So let's consider X1 and X2 in this set capital X. Uh, let me call it X1, X1. Then I'll, so then what I know is norm of X1 is less than equal to one norm of x2 is less than or equal to one. Let's pick alpha in zero one. Then alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2 norm is less than or equal to by triangles inequality. Triangle inequality, it's less than or equal to alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2, which is less than equal to alpha plus one minus alpha equals to one. So what we have shown is if x1 is less than equal to one, x norm of x2 is less than equal to one, then norm of alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2 is also less than equal to one. And therefore, alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2 is part of the set capital X1. Okay, so this is uh, a proof of why the closed circle or not a closed circle, even open circle is, is a convex set, but why this, uh, sorry, not circle, I should say sphere. The sphere, solid sphere is actually a convex set. This is a proof. Any questions on this proof? Okay, let's look at another example of convex set. AX equal to B. Okay, so this is a convex set. Why should this be the case? So let's consider X1, X2 in capital X, alpha in zero one. So I know that AX1 equals to B. I know that AX2 equals to B. So this would imply that A of alpha X1 plus one minus alpha X2 equals to alpha AX1 plus one minus alpha AX2 and uh, this is equal to B or alpha B plus one minus alpha B equals to B. So once again, what we have shown is alpha X1 plus one minus alpha X2 belongs to capital X. This is another proof. A and B are matrices of appropriate dimension here. So B is a vector and A is, is just a matrix. And equality is uh, element wise in this case. So what I wanted to exhibit through these examples was showing whether a set is convex or not is actually very simple because you just have to go through the definition and in most situations of interest within the optimization community, um, this kind of proof is fairly straightforward and uh, usually omitted in papers or references. Any question on these two examples? So this is the sphere 
and this is a hyperplane. Let me write it in a different color. This is sphere. Hyperplane. Okay, other convex sets are other examples are x equal to x such that ax less than equal to b. Um, what else? I think those are the three major, this is a half space. Those are the usual convex sets that we will encounter in optimization, sphere, hyperplane, and half space. Let's look at convex functions. So convex functions has uh, three definitions depending on the differentiability of uh, how many times the function f is differentiable. So we have a function f from Rn to R is convex if and only if one of the three conditions hold. Has anyone seen convex functions before? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So do you remember what the definition of a convex function is? Uh, it was something like if you have two points in the function and then you take uh, a straight line across any point in between those is above uh, right. f of x, the middle point. Right, right, yeah. So you are quite close. Um, so for any x1, for every x1, x2 in Rn, for every alpha in 0, 1, f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 is less than equal to alpha fx1 plus 1 minus alpha fx2. And so this is a mathematical definition and what your colleague just mentioned is, is a visual description of what a convex function looks like. So let's look at a description, visual description. So this is my Rn, uh, y-axis is my fx, and a convex function looks something like this. So if I pick any two points, this is x1, this is x2, and uh, this would be alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2. And this point is alpha fx1. So this is my fx1. This is my fx2. This point is alpha fx1 plus 1 minus alpha fx2. And what we have here is that this line segment, or at least this particular point, alpha fx1 plus one minus alpha fx2 is above the value of function at the point alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2. So that's this point. So this point is above this point.
okay any question on this uh, visualization so once again let me go through this visualization again so i have this rn i pick two points x1 and x2 on this uh, in its domain and i look at the value of function fx1 and fx2 and i draw a straight line between them and the function in between these two points is below this particular straight line it doesn't necessarily has to be below it, it all it has to be is less than equal to so i'll let me show you another example of a convex function so this is a convex function if i pick any two points and i draw a line segment between them that line segment the function is below this line segment so it can coincide with the line segment or it has to be below the line segment uh, but it cannot be above the line segment so same thing you know the entire function f of x is always below the line segment uh, uh, which connects any two points on that function Okay, so this is a convex function. How can I choose the point so I end up with like, uh, so I can, uh, I mean, I might choose points that, that they are really close to each other and they're not gonna give me enough information about the function. So is there a specific way to choose the points? Uh, no, so this is true. This has to be true for all points, X1, X2 in Rn. So you don't have to, like um, you, you, the this definition should hold across the entire domain, not just at specific two points that you pick. Okay, over the entire domain. Now, of course, you could have a function which is piecewise convex but not globally convex, but those functions will not be considered a convex function. So, let me give you an example. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there is another way to, to, to derive the function twice. It's positive, it's convex. That's right, that's right, that's right. So I, this is the first definition of convex function. It doesn't require any differentiability assumption on the function f. And I'll go through two more definitions. So remember, um, if any one of the three conditions holds, so I have to tell you about two other conditions and what you are talking about is the third condition. Okay, I just want to go over a few examples of convex functions before I go to other definitions of convex functions. Okay, so let's look at the third example, a function that looks like this. And this is a non-convex function. Uh, so let's look at, let's say I pick these two points and I see that the line segment is above the function. So probably it's a convex function, but then I pick two points here and I see that the the function itself is actually above the line segment and therefore it's a non-convex function because even though you may find points uh, where the line segment is above the function, uh, you can also find some points where the line segment is below the function and therefore it's a non-convex. Function. Okay. So this is a convex function, this is a convex function, this is a non-convex function. And just so, uh, oh, another convex function is a function like this. So this is a convex function, this is Rn, this is Fx, and this is minus log x. Well, let me call it R, so minus log x, that's a convex function. Again, I can pick any two points and the line segment is above the function. Okay, now minus log x is defined from zero infinity to r. Okay, so it's convex only in its domain, which is zero to infinity. It's not convex over the entire space because it's not defined for x equal to zero or x less than zero. Okay, so convex in its domain so these are you know various examples of convex functions okay so let me go over the definition once again so for every x1 x2 in rn for every alpha and 0 1 the function evaluated at a point 
in between x1 and x2 is less than equal to the line segment connecting the two function values so alpha fx1 plus 1 minus alpha fx2 uh, this is the above definition that we just talked about doesn't assume any differentiability structure on the function f okay so the second definition equivalent definition of convex function requires the function to be differentiable once and this definition is for every x comma y in x fy is greater than equal to fx plus gradient fx transpose y minus x, okay? And what does this definition mean? So it requires, of course, a function f to be differentiable once. And let's say I pick a point x, and I pick a point Y. Okay, so this is my FX and gradient of FX transpose Y minus X. That's this hyperplane. Okay, so this is my FX plus gradient of fx transpose y minus x. And what I'm, so the function f is convex if for every x, y, the value of function at y is above the hyperplane um, that passes through fx and is tangent to the function f itself. Okay, so this is, this is the tangent plane at fx, okay, so it just touches the function at fx and of course it, depending on the curvature uh, it may touch the function at other points but otherwise you know just draw a hyperplane which is tangent to the original function at fx and you want this hyperplane to be below the function f itself and that's the second equivalent definition of convex function assuming that the function f is differentiable once okay any question on this uh, particular definition of convex function? Okay, let's move on to the third definition, which is for every X in capital X, the second derivative of function evaluated at X must be greater than equal to zero. And remember this greater than equal to sign implies that is positive semi-definite. Okay, so for every x in x, if I look at the second derivative of function f evaluated at x, and remember this was a symmetric matrix, so we did that computation for several functions a few lectures back. And we showed that the second, actually it was done in the previous lecture. And what we had shown is that second derivative of function F is actually a symmetric matrix. Always symmetric. Okay. This is well known. Uh, we saw it last week, uh, sorry, la in the last lecture. And what we require for convexity is that it must be positive semi-definite, which means all its eigenvalues must be positive, uh, not positive, but uh, non-negative. So greater than or equal to zero uh, at every point X in the domain of the function F. Only then it is a convex function. So let's look at the example of minus log X, which is a function from zero infinity to R. So what's the first derivative? That's minus one over X. What's the second derivative? It's one over X square, which is always greater than equal to zero for all X in zero infinity. 
So therefore, minus log x is convex. Okay, now of course this definition requires the function f to be twice differentiable. And uh, which is more stringent than requiring the function f to be differentiable once. Okay, so these three are equivalent definitions of convex functions, equivalent in the sense that if your function f is smooth, you can apply any one of these three criteria to show that the function f is convex. Um, uh, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, can there be a situation where the function is not twice differentiable, but then it satisfies one and two? And then what happens in that case? So there are a lot of functions that are not differentiable, or at least they are not differentiable at specific points in the set. So let me give you an example. Um, in uh, we, we haven't talked about uh, dynamic optimization, but when we talk about dynamic optimization, particularly constrained uh, linear programs, then the value function or you, you need to minimize functions of this type. Okay, so it's a linear function, then it's some other linear function until, so this is until point x1, then point x2, and then some third linear function after x2. So this is a piecewise differentiable function, right? So it's differentiable in the, along this line, then it's not differentiable here, then it's differentiable along this line, but not differentiable here, and then it's differentiable everywhere else. So in this situation, um, you need the first definition of convexity to show that the overall function f is convex. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, was your question different from this? Uh, this was my question. Okay, great. So in that case, then, if you want to prove that a set is not convex, do you have to prove that all three conditions do not hold? No, just one. So all three are equivalent definitions. So you just have to prove that one of the conditions does not hold. And that would automatically imply that the function f is not convex. Let's, let's consider a situation. Let's consider a function that looks like this. Okay, so it's convex in this region. It's convex in this region, but then overall the function f itself is not convex because, well, it's a concave function actually. Um, so the function f is not convex. And the reason, the way to show it is, you know, if you apply the first or the second principle, no, the first definition, you can show that if I can pick two points and I draw a line segment and that line segment is below the function f itself and therefore it's a non-convex non function. <clears throat> So just pick right, one but, of the definitions and show that it doesn't hold for that function. But in the case of the example that you gave before, the yeah. one that's right above this, right. then in this case, it's not, it's not differentiable at x1 and x2, right? Right, right. So then the third condition wouldn't hold, but that function but even itself the second is will not still, hold. But even the second will not hold. Because right, but the first one holds, right? The first one holds, yeah. So all I'm saying is just pick, so pick one definition and show that that definition doesn't hold for the function f and you can prove that it's non-convex or if that definition holds, then you can show that the function f is convex. Assuming the conditions are satisfied, which means, so this is not even differentiable, so this is not, 
f is not differentiable. So two and three cannot be applied. Okay. So you can only apply one, that's it, for proving that it's a convex function or not. Okay. Yeah. So in order to apply three, you need the function f to be twice differentiable and you want the second derivative to be continuous. The same thing happens for first derivative. You want the function to be at least first differentiable once and the derivative has to be continuous everywhere. And uh, that assumption is, is not true in this case. So you can only apply definition one. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> now, of course, the other thing that is true is if your function f is convex, let's say you know that the function f is convex due to definition one and the function f is differentiable, then automatically this condition is also satisfied by that function. And that becomes very useful in proving some theorems. And, and results in optimization. <clears throat> okay. So that's all I have for convex functions. Uh, there are some properties of convex function which I wanted to list. So the first property is the set x such that fx less than or equal to r is convex for every r in uh, the real line. Okay, so this is known as the sublevel set is convex. So if f is a convex function, then the sublevel sets of the function f are also convex. Okay. The second property is, so yeah, go ahead. For the set uh, f of x is less than or equal what? Equal to r. This is r. You know what? Well, r. R is just some real number. Any other question? What do you mean by sublevel set? So this is the this is known as sublevel set. Uh, okay, let me draw a picture that makes it much easier to understand. So let's say I have this function f x. Um, I pick a real number r. And I look at the set of x such that fx is less than or equal to r. So that set is this set. Okay, so this is my x such that fx is less than or equal to r. So this set is known as sublevel set of f. Okay. So level, so this is level. This is whatever is underneath this level is sublevel. And the set of X, which is below this particular line is known as the sublevel set of F. It's just a uh, nomenclature. Thank you. Okay, so if you pick a for convex function and you look at its sublevel set, no matter which R you pick, um, it's going to be a convex set. The second property that I want to talk about, I need to define what is known as epigraph of uh, 
function f, which is defined as EPIF x comma u in Rn cross R such that fx is less than equal to u. That's epigraph of function f. That's how it's defined. And again, it would be instructive to look at a picture. Let me pick. Minus log x. This is minus log x. What does the epigraph look like for minus log x? What would this set be? Uh, fx less than equal to u. Can someone try? What's the set of all x u? So this is, this would be my x. This would be my u. So what's the set of all x comma u such that fx is less than equal to u? Come on, someone must try. You can be wrong, that's completely fine. Uh, one to infinity. One to infinity, but this is a two-dimensional object, right? So x u r n cross r. So in this case, n is equal to one. So, so you have to say something that is two-dimensional. One to infinity is one-dimensional object. From zero to the intersection with f of x. Zero to so intersection of f of x. Okay, so this is my f of x and zero to f of x. This one. Uh, I mean the intersection with R to the f of x. Okay, I I didn't quite get it. So let me let me tell you what the answer is. So this would be everything above this red line. Okay. Sorry. So this is the epigraph of F. Everything above the red line, everything above the function, including this line, that's the epigraph of epigraph of the function f, okay? I mean, this epigraph of, it could be epigraph of any function f, okay? So everything above the function going all the way to infinity, uh, that's the epigraph of the function f. So let's pick any point, x comma u here. So my fx is right here. This is my fx. And this point, has a u that is greater than equal to the value of the function at x. Okay, so that's why this is an epigraph. So everything above the function is an epigraph and a known result in convex analysis is f is convex if and only if epi f is convex. So epigraph of F is also convex. And this is a geometric definition of convexity of a function F. Oh, but I have to mention here, F is a convex function 
here an epigraph of f is a convex set so um, many a times i will probably not write not differentiate between function and set that would be obvious from the context but in this case i want to emphasize that f is a convex function if and only if epigraph of f is a convex set. So remember, epigraph of f is actually a set, and this set is convex. Okay. Now the proof of this result is fairly straightforward, so I'll leave it up to you to fill in the blanks. So this proof. Um, but uh, but it's an important result in convex analysis. Okay, so with that, I end the background material that is needed for this class. Now I want to jump into unconstrained optimization. Okay, so what we want to solve, so the question is compute minimum of fx, x in Rn, and f is any function from Rn to R. So it's an unconstrained optimization because the set, the domain of f is not constrained. or F is defined over the entire Euclidean space. Okay, that's why it's called an unconstrained optimization. And there are two things to compute. One is X star, which will be referred to as the optimal solution. And the other is FX star, which will be referred to as the optimal value. So X star is where the minimum is achieved and FX star is the value of the function F at the optimal point. Okay. So the goal for the next four or five lectures is going to be studying algorithms for computing X star and computing FX star. Okay, that's, we are just focusing on algorithms that can do that. Uh, but before we jump into algorithms, let me, con let me uh, define some more terms that are frequently used within optimization. So local minimum versus global minimum. Okay, so let me consider a function which looks something like this. Okay, and I have x1 x2, x3, and so on. Okay. So, I mean, all of you understand English. So let me ask you this question. Which of these points do you think is a global minimum? X1. 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 Yeah. Right. So this is the global minimum. Uh, which of them is a local minimum? X3. X3. X1 and X3. X1, X3. Yeah. So X1, X1 and, and X3. X3. Both of them are local minimum.
okay so look so we will will make these these concepts precise in a little bit okay so same thing x2 is a local maximum but it's not a global maximum because we can see on the other side that the function f is escaping to infinity so on this side the function f is escaping to infinity on this side the function f is escaping to infinity so x2 is a local maximum but not global maximum um so any global minimum point is a local minimum yes so every global minimum is a local minimum okay so let's make these this english terminology mathematically precise okay so x is a global minimum oh x star is a global minimum if fx star is less than equal to fx for all x and rn okay so x1 satisfies this condition because for every f, f uh, f of x1 here is less than equal to the value of function f at any other point in the entire domain x star is a local minimum if and only if there exist an open set u containing x star such that f of x star is less than equal to f of x for all x in u for all x in that open set u okay so this is now this becomes mathematically precise so the the english intuition we had about the terminologies now becomes uh, precise in terms of mathematical expression so let's look at what this implies so this is a zoomed in version of that function f and the global minimum it's easy to understand but why is it a local minimum so let's this is my x star uh, or maybe x3 and i pick an open neighborhood around x3 okay so this contains x3 this open neighborhood u contains x3 and the function f at x star is the minimum value over this entire set u okay so f of x3 is less than equal to f of x for all x in u now of course that is trivially satisfied even for this x1 i can pick any open set u and i can show that the function f is f of x1 is less than f of x for all x in u okay so every global minimum is a local minimum but uh, local minimum need not be a global minimum okay any question on this these two definitions okay so now uh what we are going to do in the next class you know the time is up so we can't go through the new math but we are going to talk about necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality 
okay so what's a necessary condition so x star is local minimum if x star is local minimum then gradient of f at x star is equal to 0 second derivative of f at x star is greater than equal to 0 again this is a positive semi definite matrix so this is known as the first order necessary condition and this is the second order necessary condition okay so what this necessary condition says uh, suppose you are at a local minimum then the first derivative of the function will be zero at that local minimum and the second derivative of that function will be a positive semi definite matrix at that point x star okay that's a necessary condition for optimality and let's look at the sufficient condition for optimality We'll go through the proof in the next class. If X bar satisfies the first derivative is zero, the second derivative is positive definite, this matrix is positive definite then x bar is a local minimum Okay, as you can notice that the two statements are quite different. In the first statement, the hypothesis is that X star is a local minimum uh, and, and then it should satisfy some conditions. In the second statement, the sufficient condition, if the point X bar satisfies a couple of conditions, so the first condition is that the derivative vanishes at that point, and the second derivative is, is a positive definite matrix at that point, then it is certifiably a local minimum. Okay. So that's why it's called a necessary condition. So if something is satisfied, if X star satis is, is a local minimum, then some conditions are satisfied. Whereas this is known as sufficient condition because if this condition is satisfied, then we know for sure that X bar is a local minimum. Okay, any question on these two conditions for optimality? Okay, now here is why convexity plays a crucial role
Suppose that F is convex. Then X star is optimal or, or X star is global minimum. If and only if gradient of F at X star equal to zero. Okay, so this is both necessary and sufficient condition for optimality because it goes both ways. If X star is optimal, then the derivative, the first derivative vanishes. If the first derivative vanishes, then X star is optimal. It's global minimum. Uh, this is under the assumption that the function F is convex. Okay. So these are the three major results in unconstrained optimization and we will um, invoke these three theorems again and again. Um, because these theorems are important in the next class, I'm gonna go over the proof of these results. And then we will talk about gradient descent algorithms that builds in on top of these necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. So with that, the class is over. If you have any questions, you can, you can ask me now. Uh, I'm gonna stick around for some time and others, if you wanna leave, you can leave. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yes. So uh, is X bar being a local mini minimum uh, both a sufficient and a necessary condition or it just, if uh, X bar being a local minimum is just a sufficient condition for it to be an optimal solution? So where, which, which these, so you're talking about theorem one, theorem two or theorem three? Uh, the theorem one and two. Theorem one and two. Okay, so let's look at theorem one. So here the hypothesis for the statement is that X star is a local minimum, okay? okay? So then some conditions are satisfied. Here, the hypothesis is different. The hypothesis is X bar satisfies these two conditions. And only then you can show that X bar is a local minimum. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay, so that hypothesis are very different in the two statements. So, um, the difference between theorem one, the second part, and theorem two, the second part, uh, is that there can be some uh, some uh, x where the second derivative is a positive semi-definite matrix, but it's not necessarily a local minimum. Absolutely, that's okay. Uh, if I had time, I would go through the example, but the example is. Um, since you have asked, the example is, let me write it here. Um, let's say I consider fx equal to x cube, and I claim that x star equal to zero, like I just pick x star equal to zero, and I look at the first derivative, it's equal to zero, I look at the second derivative, it's equal to zero, but you know we all know that x star equal to zero is basically nothing for this function. It's, 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 it's neither a local minimum nor a local maximum. It's, it's just nothing. Oh, okay. Point, right. So right. you can have these two conditions satisfied, but the X star is actually meaningless number, meaningless point in the space. So professor, a uh, sufficient condition takes precedence at this point, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So if, if, if I tell you, if I give you X star um, and I, I say that it's a local minimum, uh, the only way you can certify it is by using the sufficient condition, which is you take the second derivative and you show that it's positive definite. Okay, so I'm of course going to go through this example again in the next class because you know a lot of people are not there in this class, but uh, but you know we are going to cover these examples again in the next class. And I'll show you some more examples where um, the necessary condition doesn't hold, but it's still an optimal solution um, and so on. So a lot of examples and counter examples will be given in the next class. Any other question?
Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, the, the course. Uh, 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 first of all, congrats on the baby. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, and uh, you said you're going to be leaving for like a couple of weeks. I'm wondering who's going to be teaching this class and uh, whoever like takes uh, like uh, teaches teaches when you when you uh, when you're on the leave. Uh, so I'm planning to take the leave towards the end of the class, which is uh, Thanksgiving, somewhere around Thanksgiving break. Mm -hmm. um, the usually what happens by that time is the syllabus of the class is already over, and whatever I cover in other classes, what I have done is I've covered some additional topics just for fun, and you know half the class you know doesn't necessarily attend some of those topics because those are sort of advanced topics or. Or require a lot more background. So my hope is that I won't have to take additional lectures at that time, because usually I'm just covering additional topics. And as far as the syllabus is concerned, we've already covered the entire syllabus by, you know, the second midterm, which is November 20th. That was that that's what has happened in the past. But suppose we are not able to cover the entire syllabus by that time, then I'll just upload the lectures on YouTube and you can watch it asynchronously for those weeks. Uh, so nobody else is going to take teach this class at that time. Um, okay. But the, the grader will still will will still the TA will still be conducting office hours and answer any questions you may have. Yeah, about the project. Uh, should yeah. we follow up with him? Uh, well, uh, for the project, I'm expecting you will start working from now onwards. So if you have questions, you can ask me in October or you can ask me in November. And it's a continuous process. You know, last two weeks is not the time when you work on the project. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, professor, I have a question yes. on the part of uh, properties of convex functions. Yes. So for uh, for the property one, it says uh, the sub level set is uh, convex. Right. Should the function f x itself be a convex function or just uh, any random function? No, no, it it has to be a convex function. This is properties of convex functions. So okay. I'm assuming f is convex. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, professor, I see that uh, on Carmen assignment one is due on Monday. Yes. Uh, so, like, is it is it still going to be Monday or are you going to extend it? So it was due on Friday. I extended it to Monday. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There is not going to be any further extension, and uh, whatever okay. we have covered until today is what the assignment is based on. Okay. So technically, after right, I've you. introduced the necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality, you can actually just go ahead and solve the entire assignment one. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? All right. Uh, thank you all. I'll see you guys on Friday.